Okay, got that going. Yeah, so today we'll uh, try to hurry up, get through all the example problems, then do entropy, the example problems of entropy, and then we'll be done, and you'll know physics. And then we'll give you a test to make sure. Is entropy thermodynamics? Yes. Entropy has to do with the second law of thermodynamics. The way that the second law of thermodynamics is typically stated is if you include every, in a closed system, entropy uh, can't decrease. It's either zero or increases. And generally, zero also isn't really a possibility. So entropy increases, the way some might say it. All right, but let's do the example problems. So a gasoline truck engine takes in 10,000 joules of heat and delivers 2,000 joules of work. So the heat coming into the engine is 10,000 joules, and the work being done by the engine is 2,000 joules. This marker is garbage. Uh, the heat of combustion is 5 times 10 to the 4 joules per gram. So L is heat of combustion? Uh, it can be the heat that it takes to it's the heat to convert it from one to another. The reason L is because typically you have your equation Q is equal to ML for when you're going through a phase change. And so that's why they're doing L there. That's because we're using this equation. Yes. Okay. Let's see. And then uh, <clears throat> what is the thermal efficiency of this engine? Okay, what's the efficiency? It's a heat engine. Yeah, it's a heat engine. And it's E equals well, just W over a per second. Q You're getting oh, 2,000 okay. joules of work for every 10,000 joules of heat you put in. Right. Try again. The highest efficiency can be as a 1. That means 100% efficiency. Is it 20%? Is it 20%? How'd you get 20%? Work over, yeah. work over heat. Here's what we're putting in, here's what we're getting out. We have an efficiency of 0.2. One fifth. One fifth. So I'm at five minutes of knowledge here, because obviously it can't be more than one fifth. <laughs> I thought it was obvious. You yeah, like a seven, so never know. All right, uh, B. How much heat is discarded in each cycle? So, I'm guessing these are the units per cycle. So how much heat do we lose in one cycle? In other words, what's QC? 8,000. 8,000 joules. That's how much is wasted, the heat. QC minus? Well, here's what's coming into the system. This much is going out as work, so that much has to be going out to the cold source. Oh, yeah. Uh, C, if the engine goes through 25 cycles per minute, cycles per minute, Cycles per second. I don't know. Got a minute. Huh? So if it goes through 25 cycles per second, what is the power output in watts? Power output? What's power? Power, energy per second. How much work per second are we doing? Well, we're doing 2,000 joules of work per cycle. We have 25 cycles per second. So 25 times 2 is? 50,000. 50,000. So our power is 50,000 watts. Or 50 kilowatts. Uh, what is that in horsepower? I don't know. Just convert to horsepower. 746 watts in one horsepower. 746, why don't we have a calculator? Yeah. 50,000 divided by 746. Uh, 67. So 67 horsepower. <coughs> so we're talking about 67 horsepower truck. And then, how much?
much gasoline is burned in each cycle? How much gasoline is burned in each cycle? So here's how much heat we can get from burning a gram of gasoline. Right? Which, if we were to write that out, that's 50,000. Right? Okay. So we get 50,000 joules from burning one gram. We're getting 10,000 joules per cycle. How much gasoline are we burning in every cycle? In every second or in every cycle? Every cycle. That's a cycle. Uh, How much gasoline is burned per second? Oh, you're right. Then that would be... Oh, there's two parts. D. How much gasoline is burned per cycle? And then there's per second. So, so start with per cycle. 0.2. So we have 0.2 grams per cycle, and then if we convert that to per second, what do we have? Wouldn't that be five? Five grams per second. So that's five grams per second. This is five grams per cycle, or 0.2 grams per cycle. And then finally they said how many grams, or how much per hour, and we take that, we multiply it by three. Kilograms. So, not 360, 3,600. So take five, multiply it by 3,600, and when we convert to kilograms, then we get 18 kilograms. And we'll take the author's word for it on that one. 18 kilograms worth of gasoline burned every hour? Per hour. Right. So if you were driving in this truck at the same rate for an hour, you would have gone through 18 kilograms of fuel. What's the conversion from kilograms to gallons? Pass your phone. Oh, do you have any sort of voice activation on it? No, I haven't set it up yet. Ask it to convert 18 kilograms. How do you guys do your math? See, I type it out. I don't have to use my phone to record when I do math, so I can just ask Siri all the time. All right. So that takes care of that problem. I think that's pretty straightforward, right? How did you grams a second? Uh, 0.2 grams per cycle, multiply that by 25. Multiply. Two right. times 25 is, shift the decimal point. That is all the gas efficiency. That's 4.75 gallons, just in one hour burn. If you drive for an hour straight, you got a. You said how many gallons? 4.75 gallons. So if you got a 15 gallon tank, uh, you can go for like three and a half hours. Oh, I guess that's not bad. Is this is so late. Almost. Almost. And then that's your right. Yeah, we don't really know the speed on this, do we? All right. Uh, next example problem. A Carnot engine, so Carnot, remember, is the one that's completely reversible. It starts out with an isothermic process and an adiabatic process and back with an isothermal and back with an adiabatic. Yep. Okay. So a Carnot engine takes in, maybe we could, should, uh, I won't draw it perfectly, but just so that we can. This was isothermal, this was adiabatic, this was isothermal, this was adiabatic. Yes. And so when heat comes in on a Carnot engine, QH comes in right here, and then QC leaves right here. These are both adiabatic, so no heat. Yes. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. A Carnot engine takes 2,000 joules of heat from a reservoir at 500 Kelvin. So this line right here, if we did our uh, temperature line, here's our temperature, we'll call it T2 since it's a higher one, and then try and draw this other one. Here would be our other temperature line, T1. Right? Okay. 
on a PV diagram. Okay, so a Carnot engine takes 2,000 joules of heat from a reservoir at 500 Kelvin. So QH is 2,000 joules. Oh, and T2 is 500. And T2 is, is that in Kelvin? Yeah, 500 Kelvin. Okay. 500 Kelvin. Uh, reservoir. A reservoir isn't necessarily a body of water, it's a body of something. So you can have a heat reservoir, which is a body of heat. A heat source. A source that provides, for our purposes, a limited amount of this ink. Or an unlimited amount of this ink. Pretty common terminology. I didn't get a physics degree. This is almost as far as I went in uh, regular physics. Really? I only took one physics course after this from university, yeah. Don't you love physics though? I do. Isn't it your career passion? It's one of the things I love. I also love mathematics. I also love computer science. I also love history. I also love chemistry. You can only major in so many things. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the schools, just for probably good for you to know in general, most universities don't offer physics majors. So it has to be a pretty big university to offer a physics major. That's not a very common thing. And so around here, uh, you don't get anything physics-wise unless you go basically all the way to the U, or basically all the way down to Phoenix. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. So I just did math and computer science. If there were physics, I probably would have done that. But probably better than I did math. Complements computer science better. Yeah, that makes sense. I assume. Anyways, lost track of what we were doing. Okay, Carnot engine takes in 2,000 joules of heat from a reservoir at 500 degrees Kelvin does some work and discards some heat to a reservoir at 350 degree Kelvin. How much work does it do? How much heat is discarded? And what is the efficiency? So we're looking for work, we're looking for QC, and we're looking for E. Now the efficiency, they made that the third one for us to find, but that's actually the easiest one for us to find. One minus T1 over T2. One minus T1 over T2. Good. And once you know the efficiency, you can find the work. So T1 over T2, what's that going to give us? That's 7 tenths, right? 7 tenths, yeah. So we have a 30% efficiency. Did I do that right? Yeah. Okay. So there's our efficiency. Now we also know with uh, our Carnot engine that T1 over T2, this ratio, is equal to QH, uh, oops, it's T2 over T1, is equal to QH over QC, right? We did do that? Yeah, that's how we calculated this, that's how we came up with this equation for efficiency. Because your regular efficiency equation is E is equal to 1 minus QH over QC. QC over QH. Can't the temperature change without any heat being added or managed? Yeah, this is a coincidence only for the Carnot cycle. So the this is not true in general. To go from here to here, you cannot just do that with the regular car engine. This only holds for the Carnot cycle. It is a special property of the Carnot cycle. And so we derived the fact that we could express this this way for the Carnot cycle. But isn't there a different way to solve it than that equation? Can't you just do E equals W over QH? E, well, we don't know W. Yeah, but you know E and you know QH, so for W. Ah, yeah, because that is how we get W. But First, I was going to get QC. Oh, now you're solving QC. Okay, I see. Yeah, so I got E, then I was getting QC, and then we'll get W exactly how you said. So then we have QC here is equal to T2 over T1 times QH. 
T2 over T1. Did you do that right? Your QC is in the denominator. Whoa, thank you. One, two. Yeah, QC has to be one in QH. Good job. Okay, so this is 7 tenths of QH, right? Yeah, 7 tenths. So multiply that by 7, gives us a 14 there, then get rid of the 0, so 1,400. You see how I did that? Yeah, I think I was. Well, now you don't even need to solve it the other way. Don't you just do QH minus QC? Yeah, whichever way you want to do it. So we can easily say that the work is 600. Right? Okay, let's uh, check with the author to make sure I didn't mess anything up. Efficiency, 30%, work, 600 joules, QC. He says negative 1,400 joules, because he's talking about QC as negative. He added to the system. Okay, uh, we did that. Next one. Suppose 0.2 moles of an ideal gas with gamma 1.4. So we have n is equal to 0.2, or did I say 0.2? No, 0.2. 0.2, and I have gamma is equal to 1.4. So it's a diatomic gas. Undergoes a Carnot cycle between 227 degrees Celsius. Let's see, is that going to be the high one or the low one? That's the high one. So T2 is 227 degrees Celsius. If we convert that to Kelvin, what do we get? It's way higher. 227? Yeah. Just 500.15. And 27 degrees. T1 is equal to 3 times the other. Just going to do 500. Probably should do it by more by. And then, yeah, that's just going to be 200 less. So we're going to have 300. Uh, I see. Starting at the pressure at A is equal to. Ten times ten to the five. Well, they just say ten to six. Ten to six pascals. Oh wow, this is a big problem. Okay, we got that picture there, so we'll reference that picture. Okay. Is it Carnot? Yeah. So it's Carnot, and they're basically going to have us find the heat and work done at every port point in the cycle. Every point? Or every uh, section of the cycle. So uh, let me uh, match up our points with what they say. So they're calling that A, that B, that C, that E. Okay. I don't know why I have an A right there. Adiabatic. Um, yeah, we can remember that now. We don't get confused with our points. Okay, so we're looking at that. And we're given that the volume doubles. So let's actually erase this. So here's our PV diagram. And if this is V, then this point right here is 2V. Oh, well, C then. It doesn't tell us that. Okay. Just says so going from A to B, it doubles. Okay. So now they want us to find. Is that for D or is that for B? Or B for A? Sorry, that this is A. Let me try to shift it over a little bit. <laughs> v, and it's meant to line up with A. Gotcha. And then that lines up with B. Okay. So we're basically going to be making. Uh, Mask table here, so let's just make a table. 
A, B, C, D, at each of these points. We're looking for the We're supposed the volume, the pressure, and that should be it since we are having temperature. Find the pressure and volume at those points. Okay. So we'll find each of those. Might need some more room for the pressure. It's should be way up there. And then, so that's part A. Part B, find QW and delta U for each step in the cycle. So we have that table. So then we also have our table uh, going from A to B going from B to C, going from C to D, and going from D to A. Here. While I'm setting up this table, will you run to the office and see if you can get another marker? Yeah. Rectangular grid. It's beautiful. The heat in each case, and the delta U in each case. All right. So we're looking for the work heat and delta U in each case, and we're still need part B. C is find the efficiency directly from the results in part B. So I think we find the efficiency of the cycle. So then we look for our efficiency and compare the value, check and compare it with the value calculated from equation 20.14, which is uh, our temperature one, and see if we actually get the fact that E is equal to one minus T1 over T2. Okay, so what do we already have? We have our pressure at A. He used little A for his points, but I use big A. So it doesn't look like Pascal's. So our pressure at A, we already know, is 10 to 6. And our volume at A, we already know, is B. Their volume. I wonder if we'll end up getting actual numbers right now. Uh, Don, Mary is wondering if you're willing to judge some debates on Friday. Yes. On Friday? This week? week? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, What's the date sure. today? The date is the 27th. Today is the 27th, and it's a Wednesday. Friday is the 29th. I believe on the 5th, so that's not this, that's next week, not this week. Friday, I'll have a meeting Thursday. Do you have a phone like an iPhone 5? It's older, not that old.
I think that's fine. Yeah, I think I'm happy to do that. Okay. Yeah. I'll get the ahead really quick to see if he had actual numbers on his volumes. Uh, volume equals, yeah, he does have actual numbers on his volume. So I must be missing a starting volume somehow. Suppose you have that many moles of an ideal gas. Oh, I know the pressure and temperature. I know the temperature at A is 500. This is T, 500. Temperature B is still 500. Then we drop down to 300. And 300. Okay. So we can use the ideal gas equation to get that B. That will be fine. Now, going from here to here. Here. I'll take it one step at a time. She said she'd like to have you at nine. At nine? Oh, so in the morning? Yes. Okay, that's even easier. Okay, that should be fine. On Friday at nine. Okay. So like twelve thirty. Well, she said he's good to stay. So I've recorded, let's see, let's record the rest of our information over here. I know n is equal to 0.2 in all these cases. Gamma, this means I'm a terrible gamma. Gamma is equal to 1.4. And we now have all our information recorded, right? Yes. Erase all that. None of this is anything. And let's start filling out the table. So, you need to find the pressure and volume at each of these points, starting at A. So, starting at A, we know the temperature at A is 500, and we know the pressure at A is 10 to 6, so I can find the volume at A. How am I going to do that? I mean, V equals 19. Perfect. So, I'm going to write V is equal to NRT over P, right? My calculator is I can't believe you guys have never got a road calculator <laughs> in this whole course. I don't know, this one works kind of nice. Point zero 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 eight three one. Yep. So let's see. Uh, in terms of, we'll keep it just cubic meters. Who cares what the output does? So I'm guessing he converted to liters. So eight point three one. Didn't make myself a lot of room for volume for some reason. Eight point three one times ten to the minus four. Cubic meters. And uh, your B is just double that, right? Right. So B will be 1.66 times 10 to the minus 3. Yeah. That's really small. What is it? Cubic huh? meters. That's cubic meters. I mean, like this one is one and, one and two thirds of a liter. One and two thirds. This is almost two liters. A liter is one one thousandth of a cubic meter. Okay, and now we can find the pressure here because we know pressure is equal to nRT over volume, right? Yeah. So now we have nRT. 
RT, but instead of dividing by pressure, I'm going to divide by this times 2, which is 5 with 5 zeros, 5 times 10 to the 5, duh. Let's give you exactly half the pressure here. Why is it half the pressure? Because if the volume doubles, the pressure has to be halved. Because NRT because stayed constant. I got you. Okay. So we have the pressure and the volume there. Uh, now, going to C. So from B to C, that's an adiabatic process. Yeah. And so I know that the volume at B times, let's see if I can remember this equation. The volume to the gamma minus one, so I think it's the temperature of B times the volume at B to the gamma minus one is equal to the temperature at C times the volume at C to the gamma minus one. Yep. Is that the right equation? Yeah, you're right. So then, with that, we can calculate the volume at C. So that gives us that the volume at C to the gamma minus one is equal to, let's start plugging in what we know, Tb, temperature at B is T2, times the volume at B, whatever that is, all over the temperature at C, which in our case is T1. Okay. And then we'll raise each side. So gamma minus 1 is going to be 0.4, right? Yeah. 0 0.4, 0 0.4. And so we'll raise both sides to the minus. Not the minus one four, to the one over point four. Sorry, thank you. Right? Yeah. yeah. So now we have T two, which is five hundred, times the volume at B. And the volume at B was that times two. But the volume at B, we need to raise to the 0.4. So that to the 0.4. Hopefully I got all my parentheses on here, right? That divided by 300. 300. All to the power of. Which is point zero zero five nine six three. So that's actually going to be zero zero six five point nine six times ten to the minus. So almost six liters? Almost six liters. Okay. Now you can find Since we're three. using these numbers to calculate the next number, we should probably be validating this as we go on. V, the volume at A, 8.31 times 10 to the minus 4. Yep. Volume at B, 16.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Same thing we have. 5 times 10 to the 5 for pressure B. Volume at C, 59.6 times 10 to the minus 4. Yeah. Okay. So we're good there. And now we can calculate the pressure at C using that equation right there. So we have NRT at C is 300 divided by the volume at C. And that gives me 8.37. Did you say the temperature at C was 300 or 500? 300. Okay. 
times 10 to the 4. Okay, for pressure at C, 0.837 times 10 to the 5. He is all over the place. <laughs> all right, so we're done with C. Now we got to figure out our point at D. So, yeah, we can go from A to D is also an adiabatic process. And so I know temperature at A times the volume at A is equal to the temperature at D times the volume at D, which gives me that the volume at D is equal to uh, the temperature at A, which is T2, times the volume at A, divided by the temperature at D, which is T1. Nice. Okay. So, the volume at A, I should have just saved that number. Let's take the volume at A and put that in X for now. Okay. So we have T2, which is 500, or five, yeah, 500, times the volume at A to the power of 0.4, divided by the temperature T1, which is 300, all to the power of 1 divided by 0.4, which is... Point zero zero. So let's see, two point nine eight, two point nine eight times ten to the minus three. D has a bigger volume than. Uh, potentially. My picture, those points could be like that. Oh, so it's not it's exactly just a like random that. picture coming up there. Gotcha. Is the Carnot cycle a constant picture? Let's see. VD, we have 29.8 times 10 to minus 4. No, it's not a constant picture. It depends on what your temperatures are and what your pressures are and what your starting points are and your ending points are. It just goes an isothermal process. How far? Who cares? Do it as far as you want. Then an adiabatic process. Until you get to some other temperature, who cares? And reverse. Isn't that the most efficient approximation though? A Carnot engine is the most efficient one engine you can make. So how does that change? For between two temperatures, but the temperatures can be all over the place. What's T1 and T2? Depends on your engine. And the efficiency of a Carnot engine that does this would have been the same as if we would have started our cycle right here and made our adiabatic process go far to here if this is still on T1. Both those engines would have had the same efficiency. Well, we've just done more work. Okay. So, oh, so now we're missing pressure here. And once again, pressure, we can do 0.2 times, 0.2 times R times our temperature at D, which is 300, divided by our volume at D, and we get 1.673, 1.67 is 20, times 10 to the 5. Cool. So I was populating our table, that table. Yeah. 
and yeah, we're just getting going. Because now we need to populate this table. Okay, so the work in an isothermal process, how do we calculate the work done in an isothermal process? It is nRT times the natural log of V2 over V1. NRT, V2 over V1, where V2 is our ending volume, V1 is our starting volume. Yeah. Thank you. Natural log. Thank you. Natural log. Yes. All right. <laughs> so that's how we can calculate our work in each of these processes. So the work done going from A to B. What about the adiabatic processes? Well, one at a time. 0.2 times R times our temperature here is 500 times the natural log of our ending volume divided by our starting volume, which is just going to be natural log of 2, right? Yeah. Then we get 576 joules. So this is 576, and so the heat here also is 576. Delta U. Yeah, delta U. Yeah, for an isothermal process is zero. So we also know that we have zero right there. And we know for an adiabatic process that's zero and that's zero, right? Okay. Okay. So now uh, let's do this one really quick since it's the same equation. So for that one, I changed my 500 to a 300, and now our ratio of our volumes, but we can't just plug in that so we're going from B to A, so we're going to do our ending volume divided by the starting volume. So our ending volume divided by our starting volume, sugar, I wonder if I can find that number, 5.96 times 10 to 3. So negative 983. Mm. That seems weird. From C to D. Thank you. Oh my goodness. From C to D. C to D. No wonder I don't like it. From C to D. All right. So our ending volume is our volume at B, which is going to be 0 0.00596 divided by our starting volume. Did you get those mixed up? I did get those mixed up. Oh my goodness, I'm doing this terribly. I plugged in C for D every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my volume at D divided by my volume at C, right? Yes. yes. Okay, so my volume at D, we just care about the ratio, so just 2.98 divided by 5.96, okay. Negative 346. Okay, that I can buy. Okay. And then, so the heat here is also negative 346. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So now, we get our adiabatic process. And our adiabatic process, uh, we know that We know that no heat is added to the system. Yes. Right? 
And so that means that the work is equal to our change in inter internal energy, the negative of our change in internal energy. So our change in internal energy of our system is always and forever n times Cv times delta T. T2 minus T1. So our work then is going to be n times Cv times T1 minus T2. It's the negative of that. Yeah. Okay, and now, how do we get our CV? Well, we know that our CV over CV plus R is equal to uh, 1.4, which is 7 this, right? We do. Gamma is 7 this, 1.4. Did I do that wrong? Oh, well... It says gamma is CP over CV, so you need to put... Oh, backwards, thank you. Yeah, yeah, that makes no sense. Bigger number on top. CV plus R over CV. And so what fraction is our R, is our CV going to be? You remember the options for it? We could be calculating for it, but is it going to be uh, 3 halves R or is it going to be 5 halves R? But we know it's gamma. You could solve for C you could solve for C V real quick here if you wanted. And you can get this. How do you know? Because five halves plus one is gonna be seven halves over five halves because we solve this. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I see that if I plug that in for C V, it will give me seven fifths. Oh, so you can solve. You could just solve for seven fifths if you wanted. Yeah. You could easily solve for C V. And CVs always use very special values. You can also usually just look at it and tell. Gotcha. So there's our CV, 5 pass R. And so now we can calculate our work. Let's make sure we do this right for whichever cycle. So first plug in our numbers. So I have 0 0.2 times 1.5 times R times... T1 minus T2, which one are we talking about first? So B to C, B to C, B to C. We have our starting temperature, which in this case is 500, minus our ending temperature, 300. And so we get 499 joules. B to C, that is not what they got. Let me check our table very, really quick to make sure we don't have any obvious mistakes. 576, 576, minus 346, minus 346, K is all the same. So they just got a different number on this. 832 joules. Multiply by a negative. So delta U is equal to Q minus W. So if Q is zero, then W is equal to negative delta U. I have it down as W equals delta Q minus delta W. Does that change that? Delta U equals delta Q minus delta W? Yeah. Uh, that's what we mean here. When we say Q, we mean the change in this author uses what what was the answer for it again? There's uh, 832. Yeah, that's what I got. So I just plugged in where? I guess so. 0.2 times 2.5, not 1.5. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of simple mistakes. Okay, 831. So let's see. That was work here, is 831. Yes. So our change in energy here is 831. Wouldn't it be negative 831? Negative 831, thank you. Okay. And then this is going to be the exact same thing, except for it's going to go from 300 to 500. 
so it's going to be the negative of this. So this is negative 831, and this is positive 831. It's the same number? Should be. Because we'd be doing this same calculation, we'd just be changing the order of T1 and T2. N doesn't change, CV doesn't change, we are still using T2 and T1, we still just went from this temperature to this temperature, it's just we switched the order. Gotcha. Okay. So there's our table. Uh, and we hear efficiency. Da, 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 minus 832, minus 832. Okay, so we got all those. So now our efficiency, how do we calculate our efficiency? Our efficiency is work divided by Q sub H, which is equal to, we can add all these up to get our work. So we'll add those up to get all our work. But what's Q sub H equal to? Uh, what is that? 576. 576. Yeah. The heat in the, that comes into the system. Okay. So we'll add up all the works and then we'll divide by that. So for our works, we have those two cancel out, right? Yeah, you're left with 230. 576 minus 346. Yeah, 230. So we have 230 here. And then if you take your quotient, divided by 576? Uh, 0.4, so 40%. So we got 40% efficiency here. Okay, now T1 was 300, T2 was 500. 300 divided by 500 is 0.6. 1 minus 0.6 is 0.4. So we validated that equation. Nice. All right, that was that example. That was an example. Yes, it was. I don't like it, we can't see the clock. What time is it? It's uh, 10 10. Okay. Uh, the cycle described in example 20.3 is run backwards as a refrigerator. What is its coefficient of performance? Is that this example? Isn't that just finding K? Yeah. So what how do how do we calculate K? Uh, K is the amount of QC we get divided by the work we had to put in the system. That's how much heat we were able to remove. So 346 divided by 230. 346 divided by 230 comes out to 1.5. And that's that. 1.5, we hit right. Okay, that was all the example problems leading up to entropy. Okay, so now we can talk about entropy. Uh, intuitively, how can we talk about entropy? Entropy is the amount of disorder in a system, is loosely how we say it. This is to give you intuition for it. We'll give you an actual equation for it later, but connecting the equation to the intuition is kind of hard to do. So entropy, it's the amount of disorder in a system, or another way to say it is it's the amount of information you need to describe the system. So let me give you an, an example of a really low entropy system and a really high entropy system. Peter already saw this example, but it's worth seeing. I'll just do two cases. Do the little three? No. I don't want to write that much. <laughs> All right. So here's the game. Peter has laid out in front of him coins in this configuration, and he needs to flip. He needs to put them in some specific order that you're going to tell him. And we're going to do two different cases. So over here,
So the game is, Peter can't see what's right here. He just has 15 coins laid out in front of him. So three rows, five coins each laid out in front of him. You're the only one that can see this configuration. Your job is to tell Peter how to arrange the coins. Right? So if you see this configuration, what do you tell Peter? You are trying to make it like the last one. You are trying to tell Peter to put all his coins into this configuration. What would you tell him? Yeah. Put them all on heads. Cool. Round two. Now your job is to tell Peter to put the coins in this configuration. What do you tell him? And you see how, for some reason, even though it's the same amount of coins, it's a lot harder to communicate this system than it is this system. Yeah. This is a high entropy system, this is a low entropy system. And you'll notice that if you zoom in and you look closely at just one coin, so if you were way zoomed in just looking at one coin, there's nothing really special about this system. If you just look from coin to coin to coin to coin, there's nothing weird. Same with over here, they pretty much look the same. It's only when you zoom out and see the big picture that you see something strange is going on. And somehow this system has a lot of order and this one's really chaotic. So entropy is a problem, is a, is a property of states of systems. And it's not intrinsic to just that one little particle. It doesn't make sense to ask about the entropy of this one little atom of air. So entropy is a problem of, is a, yeah, it's a property of states. Because fundamentally, there's no different properties between this thing right here and this thing right here. And yet, this is part of a high entropy system, this is part of a low entropy system. In fact, half the things in this system, roughly, are identical to things in this system. Yeah. Okay. So that's intuition. Entropy, uh, High entropy means it takes a lot of information to communicate what's going on in the system. Low entropy means uh, it takes little information. So roughly speaking, the amount of information you need to communicate in order to talk about what's going on in the system. Now, entropy, what is entropy? What's our calculation for entropy? Entropy is calculated, an infinitesimal change in entropy, ds, is equal to an infinitesimal amount of heat added over some constant temperature, t. S is entropy. Yeah, sorry. S, we use S as for entropy. Of course. Of course. We can't use E. That's so efficient. All right. So this is for an infinitesimal change in entropy where temperature is constant. If you're talking about the change in some system and if the temperature doesn't change in that system, then you can calculate your change in entropy, delta S, as just the total heat added to the system divided by the temperature, if the temperature stays constant. Gotcha. If the temperature doesn't stay constant, then your change in entropy, you're gonna have to calculate with an integral of dQ dt or of dqt. So here's how we calculate it in general. Here's a special case for where temperature is constant. I was going to say, and I just lost it. Oh, change in entropy. Okay. So entropy, it turns out, is a state variable, which means if you take some system of gas, it, entropy, we can think about it uh, a lot like gravitational potential energy. When I take a one kilogram object and I raise it one meter in the air, how much did its potential energy increase? By one meter. 
if I raise it one meter up in the air and it weighs one kilogram, how much does its potential energy increase? We're talking about gravitational potential energy. Going back to MGH. Oh, just 9.8. Just 9.8 joules, right? Now, it doesn't matter if I would lift my marker like this, assuming my marker is one kilogram, or if I would have done this. As long as it starts and ends in the same place, the change of potential energy is the same. It's independent of the path. Okay. That's what we mean by state variable. All you care about is its initial state and its final state to calculate the change. Same thing with entropy. So if my gas starts out here and it ends here, I don't care how it got from here to here, the change in entropy is going to be the same. That makes sense. Sanity test. What's my change in entropy if I go back to where I started? Zero. 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 Just like my change of potential energy, it, no matter what I do, if I come back to where I started, my total change of potential energy is zero. It's a state variable. So we are calculating the changes in potential energy, or er, er, the changes in entropy. Changes in entropy. That's what we're interested in. Changes in entropy. You can calculate the absolute entropy in a system, and there is a way to do that, but it's absurd. And we don't care. You can care about it for really, really small or really, really simple systems. But in general, calculating entropy for a system we don't really care about. We just care about the change in entropy. Gotcha. And so we can pick our zero entropy to be whatever we want when we're calculating the change. We can say, I'm going to call this point my zero, and then just calculate the change from there, like we do with potential energy. Or I may call this point randomly 10. Or I may say the entropy here is x, and then double my height. Now we're at 2x, whatever. Okay, You with me? So we're going to do a lot of that type of math where we kind of ignore calculating the absolute entropy, and we're just going to do set up tricks. Say, pretend the entropy at this point is some number, just so that just because we're only interested in calculating the difference. Okay. Yeah. So in, in a sense, we're, well, I don't know about that, but okay. I think I made that pretty clear. I'm afraid if I add more, I'll confuse more, then I'll help. All right, entropy. So let's do one real quick uh, example. Well, let's just do a bunch of examples with entropy. I feel like that's one of the best ways to kind of wrap your head around this thing, because that just feels like a weird definition. Yeah. There's hardly any intuition for that. So let's do some examples. Hopefully that will help with intuition. Then we'll continue talking about entropy. I don't know if we'll need a reference to the Carnot cycle here at all. Uh, entropy, when we calculate our changes in entropy, we do it over reversible processes. So this is the change in entropy when we add some small amount of delta Q in a reversible way. And we'll see what we do when we come across non-reversible processes, because almost everything in the universe that we see is a non-reversible process, right? Yeah. So how do we calculate the entropy of obviously non-reversible processes? And we'll see that in a second. The trick will be we'll choose whatever path we want, because we don't care what path. It's like when I say calculate the change in potential energy when I lift this marker, okay. you treat it as though I just lifted the marker straight up. What if I really lifted the marker like this? You don't care. So you can pretend I just lifted it straight up for the purposes of the problem. I see. So even though changes in our universe happen in non-reversible ways, we can pretend they happen in a reversible way, calculate the change in entropy, and it's the same as a non-reversible change. So it's just simplifying your process? Yeah, so we're going to pretend that every change that happens in our universe, anytime we want to calculate the change in entropy, we're going to pretend it happened in a reversible way, even though it doesn't. Okay. Because all we care about is the change in entropy. If it started out here and it ended up here, we don't care about the path that it took. So what? It took a non-reversible path. We're going to model it with a reversible path because the change is the same. So even though you're when you slide the chair, it can't come back to you. You're going to treat it like it comes back to you because it changes the same? Well, no. 
what we're going to say is entropy increased when I push that chair. The way I pushed that chair was a non-reversible process where it was losing heat to friction and whatever else. Mm -hmm. I may have modeled that as a completely reversible process where I slowly slide the chair and it's always in perfect equilibrium with the carpet and da 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 da. There's no way to really make it reversible, but so we're gonna, it's not going back. It's going from no, it's not going to come back to me. Okay. We're still going to have the same starting point and the same ending point. The actual path that we're going to use if we model the thing, it would really be something wild that wouldn't even make sense a lot of the times mm -hmm. on a PV diagram. It would jump all over the place. Like when you drop a rock on a piston. Yeah. It's like trying to model what happens on a scale when you jump on the scale. The scale doesn't raise like this, up to your weight. You jump on the scale and it goes, and then comes down. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And we're going to ignore all that and pretend that the scale just went nice, slow, thermal equilibrium the whole time. And it's going to give us the same weight either way. Well, scribbled on the picture somehow. We have to erase it. I hope we didn't need it. Use that purple to stick something in. I think it's the eraser. Oh well. Come in. I'm so sorry to interrupt. This is great for Miss Mary. All right. Thank you. No. Power changes people. Love is a choice to be made. It is permissible to deceive others. Wow. All of them but mine. All of them but yours. I hate to watch you get there and embarrass me after all the time, effort, and energy I put to you. Yes, sure, makes sense. <laughs> okay. change of entropy of one kilogram of ice that is melted reversibly at zero degrees Celsius and converted to water at zero degrees Celsius, the heat fusion of water is 3.34 times 10 to the 5 joules per kilogram. So the heat fusion for water, 3.34 LS heat fusion times 10 to the 5 uh, joules per kilogram. Joules per kilogram, and then how much water did we have? One kilogram. Okay. So the mass of water is one kilogram. So we're going to talk about the change in entropy of this ice cube that melts. Oh, so you find so we've got an ice cube, and it's in some metal container. The metal container is going to stay zero degrees Celsius. So reversible process. And we're going to convert the ice. To water. Do we convert the temperature to Kelvin? Do we can yes, always and forever our temperatures are in terms of Kelvin. Gotcha. So what is our change in entropy? Our change in entropy then, since our temperature is staying constant, we can just calculate it like this. It's gonna be the heat that goes into the system divided by the temperature of the system. The temperature of the system is 273.15. And now the heat that goes into the system is equal to is 3.34 times, times 10 to the 5. And so we get 1, 2, 2, 2. Well, probably around that to 3. Let's see, he only has three significant meters. So this is equal to 1.22 joules per kilo. Times 10 to the three. Yeah. 1.22 times 10 to the three joules per kilo. Okay. And that's the increase in entropy in that system. So that's the increase of chaos in the system. Disorder, I should say. Yes. 
Okay, so Why is it based that's on so temperature? weird. Huh? Why is it based on temperature? Uh, all right, let me try to uh, give the intuition for uh, heat over temperature. Imagine that we've got an atom really, really cold. So it's hardly moving. So base payoffs of zero? Or uh, a gas, really cold, so that it's hardly moving. Maybe not absolute zero, but the point is, it's really cold, so the gas is only jiggling a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. As I add heat to the gas, a little bit of heat to a cold gas is going to create a bigger change in how much it's jiggling than if you've got already a really hot gas, which is jiggling a lot, and I add the same amount of heat. Yeah. So if you've got a really cold system, a little bit of heat can increase the disorder a lot. If I've already got a really hot system, then adding the same amount of heat doesn't create the same amount of disorder. It doesn't increase the disorder by the same amount. Kind of intuitively like turning on a light. You come in here, you turn on one bank of lights, it makes the room way brighter, you turn on the second bank of lights, it didn't double the brightness of the room. Yeah. Similar type of thing there. So that's why temperature is in the denominator here. If the temperature is already really, really high, then there's already a lot of energy in the system. And it's already a pretty chaotic system. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so adding heat or adding disorder to the system, because adding energy to the system creates more disorder, right? So adding heat to the system isn't really going to add that much more disorder. But if T is really small, then adding a little bit of heat can add a lot of disorder. That makes sense. Okay, so they're just trying to get intuition for those. All right, let's do another one. One kilogram of water at zero degrees Celsius is heated to 100 degrees Celsius. Compute its change in entropy Assume that the specific heat of water is four point or four thousand one hundred ninety. So the specific heat of water is four thousand one hundred and ninety. And the temperature changes. And our initial temperature, T naught, is or I guess we usually use T one, right? T one, we're starting at zero degrees Celsius. T2 is going to be 100 degrees Celsius. Yeah. yeah. And, sorry, how much water did we have? One kilogram. One kilogram. Mass is equal to one kilogram. Oh, that was, yeah, same in both cases. Okay, so in this one, the temperature obviously isn't constant. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to have to calculate our change in entropy by taking the integral. So we are going to have to do the integral of dq over t. All right, now we're stuck. How can I represent dq in terms of t? Because t is now a variable, it's changing. So I need to somehow get dt in here. Well, dq, and maybe you remember what q is. What? N times c times t. N, m, m, c, times our change of t, you say dq, we can replace it with dt, right? Oh, yeah. So this is equal to the integral from our starting temperature, which in terms of Kelvin is 273, to our ending temperature, which is 373, of mc dt over t, right? mc is a constant, we can pull that out, and what's the integral of dt over t? Natural log, perfect. So this is going to be mc times the natural log of our ending value, 373, divided by the natural log of our starting value, 273. And so we take our mass, which is 1, times uh, our uh, specific heat for water, 4,190, times the natural log of 373 divided by 273, which gives us 1,310 if we do three significant figures. Let's see, yeah, three significant figures, 1,310. So this is equal to 
Skip the example from 20.7 example from a gas expands at adiabatically and reversibly. What is its change in entropy? So if a gas expands adiabatically, what's its change in entropy? It expands adiabatically. Mm -hmm. Well, your EQ is zero, so it doesn't change at all. Perfect. No increase in entropy during adiabatic processes. So if it's a perfectly reversible adiabatic process, no change in entropy. Interesting. Okay. Why? Huh? Why? No heat. The Q is always zero. Okay. So next we start out with a box here. And exactly halfway through the box, we have some partition. And all the gas is contained on this side of the box. Okay. Now, we remove the partition, and the gas expands. So here, it's in just volume B. Here, we'll say that this has volume 2B. Okay. We remove the partition and the gas suddenly expands. So the gas didn't do any work as it expanded. We just suddenly got rid of the partition. Question, what do you think happens to the temperature of the gas here? Why did it go down? What do you think? Went to the other side. Air, it's a vacuum. No air, I mean a vacuum. Air, vacuum. We remove it, the air expands out. And what do I think would happen to the temperature? Yeah. It would have to go down again. Temperature has to get lower, right? Because it's occupying a higher volume. Yeah. Does that make sense? sense? Uh -huh. Good, because it's wrong. Okay. The temperature doesn't change because the gas didn't do any work. Remember, temperature is a measure of the internal energy in the gas. Yeah. You can't just have energy disappear. It's got to go somewhere. It moves. It didn't move something, though. In a piston, the gas does work to push the piston. Here, the gas did no work. We just got rid of a boundary. So it moved to the other side. So it moved the the gas moved, but the, these gas molecules were always moving. They're jiggling around all the time. It just took longer for them to hit the wall. Yeah, that makes sense. So the pressure can go down, that's fine. But the temperature cannot go down. Why? What's the connection between temperature and work? The connection between what? Temperature and work. Temperature is a measure of internal energy. And delta U is equal to Q minus W. When I remove that partition, did I add heat to the system? No. Did the system do any work? No. Zero, zero leaves us zero. So delta U didn't change, so the temperature has to be the same. Oh, yeah. So if we model this on a PV diagram, here's our temperature T. At one point, the gas was over here at B, and at the next instant, it took a little bit of time for it to actually spread, but roughly speaking, it was instantaneously over here at 2B, and it just leaped. So it was an isothermal reaction process? Uh, sure, the temperature remains the same. But my point is, is this, this is not the path it took. It did not do this. What do you mean it didn't do that? 
this is what would happen if this were a piston and I slowly had it heat to the system and it slowly expanded. Look, this is saying it was here, then it was here, then it was here, and it was a nice, slow, steady expansion, maintaining the same temperature in a nice reversible way. Oh, I see. That is not what happened. It was here, and then it was here. Yeah. I'm looking at It doesn't even make sense to talk about the pressure of a gas when it's expanding. What's the pressure? What's the volume? I, I don't know. Those concepts, they don't make sense while it's expanding. Because if I remove this, the instant after I removed it, one of these would have had a ton of speed, so it would have shot over here pretty quick. What's the volume of that gas? And now it's no longer being pushed this way, so what's the pressure on the gas? Yeah. So it's hard to say, but the gas is going to dissipate out pretty quick. And so it's going to be, I don't know what to say it does in between, but one minute it's here, one minute it's there. And this is a non-reversible process. Once the gas spreads out of the box, I can't say, okay, now gas, go back on this half. <laughs> yeah. Right? Okay. So this is a non-reversible process. It was here, then it was here. We want to calculate the change in entropy. When calculating the change of an entropy, since it's a state variable, we don't care about the path. We can choose any path we want. So we can pretend that the path it took was this nice, crisp, clean path like that. And calculate the change in entropy for this path. And since this path starts and ends where the system starts and ends, it will give us the same entropy. I see. That's quite OK. So now let's calculate our change in entropy. It's going to be equal to our integral of a uh, You don't need to do the integral. Yeah. yeah, thank you. We just need to work. It's a isothermal process, so Q and work are the same thing. Yes. So it's so we just need to calculate the work. What's the work then going from here to here? Uh, NRT times the natural log of V two over V one. NRT times the natural log of two V over V is two. Need no temperature. Yeah, so uh, I don't know what they gave us the temperature of the gas. So let's see what their actual answer is. Yeah, they gave us variables. So here's our Q, right? Mm -hmm. So what was our change in entropy then? Uh, NR natural log 2. Oh. NR natural log 2. Can you solve that. for that? Huh? You can solve for that. We don't know N and R. Or we don't know N. Yep, that's all we care about. We don't know N. I think maybe they plug in when it's all said and done. No, they don't. OK, so there's our answer. So for this expanding gas, and that's one that we'll see here in a second. So let me re put that up here somewhere where we'll remember it. We got N R times natural log. So that's we'll, only when the volume doubles up. That's only when the volume doubles. We're going to redo this example, but calculating entropy, uh, the brute force way. The brute force way? Yeah. Okay. You'll understand in a second why I put that number up there. Uh, let me see. For the Carnot engine, example 20.2, we erased it. We still have our table here. Let's see if we can just answer this from our table. Otherwise, we'll skip it. What is the total entropy change during one cycle? So our total entropy change during one cycle. Well, our increase in entropy is we had this much, uh, we had this much coming in at this temperature, and then we had this much going out at this temperature. Yes. So delta S here, our change in entropy is going to be equal to our increase in entropy is going to be QH over our higher temperature, which we call T2, right? Yeah. Minus, or plus if we, I'll do minus, QC, we'll keep thinking about QC as a positive number, over T1. And we'll see what that equals. That will be our change in entropy, right? That will? Yeah. 
Here's our change in entropy during one part of the cycle. Here's our change in entropy during another part of the cycle. The two adiabatic parts of the cycle don't have any entropy. Add the change in entropy for all four paths. That's our total change in entropy in one cycle. But in that equals zero? Wouldn't that equal zero? Because you're ending on the same point. Sure hope so. <laughs> OK. Let me make something a little bit more clear about this. When I run my car outside, so it's going through the auto cycle over and over again, is the entropy increasing or decreasing or staying the same? Staying the same? No. Entropy is increasing in the universe, always and forever when you're running your car. The problem is, is that we're not, we're not including the whole system when we talk about running your car. For, from the perspective of just a car's engine, yeah, entropy is roughly staying the same. But the car is also doing something. It's releasing a bunch of heat outside. Oh, I see. And it's heating up that environment. Yeah. So while the entropy in your car stays roughly the same, the entropy of the environment is increasing. It's heating up outside. And that heat is radiating out into space, heating up the system. So entropy is always increasing. And if it ever looks like you found a place, oh, that's weird, entropy's staying zero, it's because you're not counting for the whole system. I see. So if you keep track of everything being affected, entropy's going to increase. And you're saying that that's the case with this? For the auto cycle, yeah, we have heat coming in and heat going out. We're going to find out that the entropy for the cycle is zero. Okay. But heat still left the system. And so overall, entropy increased in the world for running the cycle. That makes sense. Uh, maybe. Maybe for this special cycle, since it doesn't exist, entropy might actually be zero running this cycle. So the, because the real rule is entropy is either zero or increases, can never decrease. So since you can't ever actually have the car not cycle, maybe actually running it is zero entropy. But in the real world. Because it's absorbing be. heat and giving off heat, so I bet that the entropies cancel out there. But in the real world, you running your car, that's not the same thing. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Forgot what we were doing. We did that one, we won this one. For the Cardinal engine in this example, what is the total change in entropy during one cycle? So calculating a brute force, QH over T2, QH is right here, so we have 576 divided by 500. And then we minus QC, which is 346, divided by 300. And we get negative 0 0.00133333, or approximately zero, because we have rounding errors. Okay. Da, 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 da. Let's see, what's this one? Suppose one kilogram of water. Yeah, this is a good one to see. All right, so next case we're gonna think about is I'm going to have some hot water at 100 degrees Celsius, and I'm going to have some cold water at, I think we'll leave that for water. I'm going to have some cold water at zero degrees Celsius. Okay. So 100 degrees Celsius water, zero degrees Celsius water, and I'm going to mix the two waters together. Okay. Now, intuitively, the cold water has more order, less disorder. The water's yes. jiggling less. The hot water has more disorder, less order. They're jiggling more. So as I mix the two, the hot water becomes more ordered and the cold water becomes more disordered. 
Okay, that makes sense, right? And they're going to come to an equal temperature of 50 degrees Celsius if it's the same amount of both water, 1 0 degrees, 100 degrees, mix them both. You're going to end up with 50 degrees Celsius water. Okay, so what do you think is going to happen to the entropy in that case? Not stay zero? No, it makes sense. Well, it can stay zero stay or go up. up. Entropy just can't, just can't decrease. Makes sense for it to stay zero. You sticking with up? So we got up and zero? Yeah. Well, that covers our basis. <laughs> All right. So, uh, how's the best way to say this? Well, let's make sure we got our numbers up here. Suppose one kilogram, so both our masses, M1 is equal to one kilogram, uh, we'll say M of our pot, maybe, and the mass of our cold is one kilogram, and we'll say the temperature of our pot is uh, 373.15, right, 100 degrees Celsius, and the temperature of our cold is 273.15 uh, degrees Celsius. Specific heat of water, 4,190. Okay, and I think we should be good. All right, so let's uh, start with the, uh, I don't know which one to do first, and how to mark this. Uh, the change in entropy uh, for the cold water, <laughs> So the cold water's entropy goes up, the hot water's entropy goes down. Right? So you're going to add them, them together. Gotcha. So I, I guess we could do it all in one go. Sure. So our change in entropy is going to be equal to the integral from, we're going to get an increase in the entropy. We're going to have m mass of the cold times uh, the heat capacity times dt over t. Same, same way we did it before, right? Our cold water starts at zero degrees Celsius and ends at 50 degrees Celsius. Oh, oh we need Kelvin. So it starts at zero degrees Celsius and it ends at 50 degrees Celsius. Yep. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then we're going to we can say add, I'll switch this to subtract in a second. I can say add and say that my hot water goes from uh, 100 degrees Celsius to zero degrees Celsius, or I can subtract and flip the balance. Doesn't matter. Okay. Let's Maybe we'll keep it add for okay. now. Just to make sure you see how it all comes out the same in the end. Okay, so this one starts at 373.15, and it ends up at 323. 0.15, and this one is still m c d t over t, right? Yeah. Okay. They both have the same mass, and they both have the same c. So I'm just going to pull that all the way out of everything. You with me? Yeah. When we integrate d t over t from here to here, we're going to have the natural log of this over this. going to add that with the natural log of this over this, which is going to be a negative number. Yeah, that makes sense. Any of you want to change your answer before we plug in? No. <laughs> Uh-oh, someone's going to be embarrassed. Alright, so we have the mass times the heat capacity, 4190, times the natural log of 
323.15 divided by 273.15 plus the natural log of 323.15 divided by 273.15 and we get 1,400 if we're doing two significant figures. So why does it increase instead of staying the same? I don't know, I didn't see an answer to it. Because I accidentally hit a two instead of a three. Okay, one hundred and two joules, which is what you did. Okay. And so it's equal to 400 joules. So why is it increasing instead of staying the same? Because the hot water is at higher temperature than the cold water. And the small temperature difference of the hot water doesn't have the same decrease in disorder as the same temperature increase in the cold water has increase in disorder. Okay. So it's at higher temperature. So 102 joules, and once again, entropy basically always increases. There's very, very few exceptions. I don't know any real world exceptions when we're not dealing with idealizations where entropy doesn't actually increase. Mm -hmm. And mixing cold water and hot water, that's definitely something you can do. So if you can easily pull it off in this universe, then uh, entropy definitely increases. Okay. So now, the actual, uh, well, Let's draw some more points. What, what's our time? Five to 11. Yeah. Five to 11. Okay, we got five minutes. Are you guys still doing panels? Yeah. Having that clock cover drives me nuts. Yeah, we have two more. Okay. Once again, let's talk about points. So going back to talking about points, uh, we're going to talk about four coins. I'm going to write down all the states that the coins can be in. I'm not going to draw the circles. I'm just going to do H for head and P for test. So we can have, we have four coins. We can have H, 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 H. I can have H, 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 T, H, H, T, H, H, H T, H, H. H. T H H H. Ah, marks are good. I can have H H T T. I can have H T H T. I can have T H H T. I can have H T T H. I can have T H T H. I can have T. T H H. I can have T T T H T T H T T H T T H T T T and then all T's finally. Okay, so this is supposed to be an example of, we're using coins because coins are easy to talk about, but basically we've got a very simple system composed of only four molecules, and each of those four molecules for some reason can only be in one of two states. Okay. That's what tells. Uh, way oversimplification. Yeah. Okay. Now, what I have written out here is we would call the microstate. The microstate meaning you know the state of every individual thing in the system. Okay. Now, if I were to talk about the macro state of each of these, the way I would describe their macro state is 
This one is all heads. This one is one tails. This one is two tails or two heads, whatever. Maybe you can keep up everything in terms of heads. Three heads, two heads, one heads, no heads. You with me? Now notice that for this state, if I tell you it's all heads, you already perfectly know the micro state of the system without looking at it. Mm -hmm. You already know it has to look like that. However, if I tell you three heads, you have no clue which of these four states it's in. Okay. So if you know the macro state of the system, it gives you some information about the micro state, but less information about the micro state of the system. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So given the macro state of the system, there are going to be so many micro states that satisfy that macro state. Yes. In other words, uh, let's try to keep this real simple. There's only one state that the gases can have in terms of their velocity. So let's say we were talking about velocities of gases. If you tell me that the temperature of the gas is zero degrees Kelvin, I know the velocity of all those atoms instantly. Of knowing one of the atoms? No. If, if the temperature is zero degrees Kelvin, how fast are my atoms jiggling? They're not. Yeah. So the temperature in that case tells me really quickly all my atoms' speeds. Yeah. Right? Okay. As the temperature increases, the possibility of their speeds also increases. That makes sense. Okay. So measuring temperature is like measuring a macro state. And there's so many micro states that could possibly give that same macro state. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so that's what we mean by macro state versus micro state. Macro state is the measurements we make in our day to day lives, like taking the pressure of a gas, the volume of a gas, things like that. Those are macro state measurements. And they're going to tell us about the micro state. state. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. So, quick intuition if I double the volume of a gas, well, we'll actually do that exact example. Maybe that's the example that we actually do here. Let me give you the equation first. The equation for entropy. The equation for the entropy of the system, S, is equal to K. This is the K, uh, K equals R over uh, Avogadro's number. That K, absurdly small number. I'm not even percent sure that that's what that K is. He's got to have a list here somewhere. R over anything. Okay, yeah. So there's K there. Times the natural log of W, where what is W? Or no. W is the amount of microstates that correspond to the given macrostate. So I know the macro state of my system. I take some measurement. I know it's macro state. Yeah. I need to know how many possible micro states give me that macro state. How do you know that though? <laughs> exactly. Unless we're talking about very simple systems, this blows up. And it becomes impossibly complex to talk about. Yeah. Which is why you never do this. <laughs> okay. okay. But. Given some certain macro state, if you want to know the entropy of that macro state, you calculate the possible micro states that give you that particular macro state, and here's its entropy. So you never want to use this equation. Well, there's times where it's useful. We'll use it here in a second. Okay. But now notice how this is set up. If my macro state is something like all heads, how many microstates give me all heads? One. One. What's the natural log of one? One. X. X to the power of what is one? Or E to the power of what is one? Zero. 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 That's right. Zero. So we have it set up so that when there's only one microstate, then the entropy is zero. And as there's more than one microstate, entropy increases. Okay. 
So this has an entropy of zero. This is a zero entropy system. If we're talking about just the fact that there's heads and we're ignoring the fact that those are coins made out of atoms, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. If we're talking about just heads on a computer screen. The entropy of that system is just one. And now you're talking about the entropy of this system. That's natural log of four times some super small number. It's absurdly small. This has a teeny bit of entropy. This system. How about your two heads? That still has a teeny bit of entropy. But it'd be a lot bigger than the others, right? Because, yeah, entropy is meant to talk about the entropy of things like uh, moles of atoms. Yeah. <laughs> and so four coins, yep, doesn't have a lot of entropy. It's almost nothing. Okay. Okay. What's W again in words? W is the amount of microstates okay. for a given macro state. So if this is your macro state, W is equal to 1. If this is your macro state, W is equal to 4. If this is your macro state, W is equal to 6 or 1. Make sense? Yeah. OK. So now, let's one more time do this example. Calculating the difference in entropy using this equation. From when it was split in half to when you expanded it? And I don't think we're given uh, extra rules. Okay. So it started out, we had our divider in here, and we had the entropy of our system. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say that the entropy in our system, S, was equal to K times natural log of, I'm just going to put W1 there. It's your first state. I'm just going to say, here's the entropy for before we take out the divider. Here it is. Now we take out the divider. And the gas starts bouncing around. Mm -hmm. Now what did we do by taking out that divider? We didn't change the temperature of the gas. So the possible velocities available to the gas is still the same. Okay. Right? So we didn't change anything there because temperature is the same. What we allowed is the gas molecules to be in more positions. Yes. This gas can now be in double the positions it could be before. That makes sense. Same with this atom, or molecule. Same with this molecule. So we just barely doubled the okay. options available to every molecule. We just okay. increased the number of states by 2 to the n, where capital N is the number of molecules in the system. Oh, I see. Right? So it's just uh, 2 W1. So if we call that S1, S2 now is equal to K times natural log of 2, let me use parentheses here so we don't get confused, 2 to the N times W1. Whatever our number of, whatever the number of microstates were for our system when the divider was, when the divider was here, Mm -hmm. Whatever that number was, once you remove that divider, here's a new number of possible microstates. Okay. Because the only thing removing that divider did is double the amount of positions each molecule could be in. We doubled the amount of positions the first atom could be in, the second, the third, the fourth, for all n. Gotcha. Does that, that make sense? sense? Yeah. Okay. So now, uh, if we do S2 minus S1, our change in entropy, what's that equal to? We have this minus this, we'll factor out the K. So we have K times our ending entropy. Maybe you're good with me skipping straight to this. K times natural log of this divided by this. Yeah. Two to the N times W1 over W1. Isn't that just two to the N? Which is two to the N, and I can bring my N out. Oh. Yeah. So this is going to be K times capital N times natural log of 2. Now natural log, or capital N, is the number of atoms I have. Yes. So if I want to write it in terms of the number of moles I have, it's going to be the number of moles I have times Avogadro's number is equal to capital N, right? Okay. So your K and K yep. is equal to R divided by Avogadro's number. 
So it's r times n. So it is equal to rn, which is exactly what we got last time when we calculated it. which was something that we talked about last time a little bit, but let's make that clear again. Entropy usually increases in a the system. There's no reason, really, that the gases couldn't all come back and collaborate right there, right? Yeah. And if we let the system run forever for an infinite amount of time, then, yes, the gas would eventually come back into this box. But what are the odds of the gas doing that? Uh, n equals n small. And I want to give you a sense of how absurdly small this probability is. Okay. There are roughly 10 to the 80 atoms in our universe. Imagine I asked you to, I said, I'm thinking of a random atom somewhere in the universe. I want you to go pick that exact atom. And if you gave me forever, I could go through all of them. But the point is, what are the odds? You got one guess one of the guess. atom that I am thinking of. That the odds are impossible. What are the odds that you guess that atom? One over ten to the eighty. Yeah, but so that's the number. But we can't make sense of that number. That number is so meaningless to us. But if you try to think about it, so what do I do? I'm going to go outside, I'm going to go pick a random star, teleport to that star, pick another random star, teleport to that star, pick another random star, teleport to that star, pick something random, either the star or something in its solar system, like a rock orbiting around the star, and then go pick an atom on that rock. What are the odds that you pick that atom? That is 1 over 10 to the 80. Yeah. That is absurdly small. Okay. Right? Yes. So imagine that I said that this happening, the odds of this happening, was something like one half, I'll just give you what it is now. It's roughly, we don't care about the exponent, it's roughly one half to the 10 to the 26. This is not one half to something like the 80. This is one half to the 10 to the 26. All right, 10 to the 80, here's roughly the number of atoms in our universe. Yeah. We're trying to get a notion for, we have a 10 here instead of a 1 half here, doesn't really matter. Trying to get a notion for something like 10 to the 10 to the 26, how absurdly big that is. Oh, that is massive. That is so massive, it hurts the brain to even think about. I can't write this number. If I were to try and write this number out, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, you know how many zeros I have to use? 10 to the 26 zeros. If I could write my zeros, the size of a hydrogen atom, and I were trying to write this number out, starting right here, so 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and I wrote my zeros so that they were the size of a hydrogen atom, and they're all touching in a line, it would be that number, when I had it written out, would be a thousand times the size of our solar system. <laughs> All right? Okay. So this is completely different than 1 over 10 to the 80. I can write 10 to the 80 on this board, no problem. That's real easy. 1 with 80 zeros. That's stupid easy to write. Writing a number like this, <laughs> it's so absurdly massive, we can't even make sense of it. And so your probability is 1 over 2 to the 10 to the 6, to the 26. That's the probability of this happening. But there is a chance. There is a chance. <laughs> but you will randomly pick an atom I have hidden in the universe several times over, getting it right every time, <laughs> before that happens. It is absurdly small probability. And it's hard to make those numbers. Oh, is that why yesterday you were saying it's impossible? Right. It may as well be impossible. Is it technically impossible? No. Will you ever see it? No. <laughs> Am I positive of that? 
Yes. <laughs> positive of that is when you flip a coin, it's not going to land on its side 50 times in a row. <laughs> or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, it's absurdly small. No chance. Okay. So, yes, technically entropy can increase. Will it ever increase? Uh, maybe in one little scenario once in the universe lifetime. Who knows? Then there was one small little case where it increased or it decreased a little bit. I mean, outside that, no. Okay. So that finishes entropy, that finishes thermodynamics, that finishes physics. Wow. That's the end. You did it. Calculus and physics. Entropy is going to develop. Now, you just have to pass your test. <laughs> <laughs>